Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk about common factors that can introduce errors into your signal chain and what to do about them. And specifically, we're going to take a look at offset error and gain error. Now, in one sense, signal chains have never been better. The errors one used to expect in precision amplifiers have been greatly reduced, but the demands on those amplifiers have only grown as high-resolution digital systems have become more common. It's not unusual to find 24-bit analog-to-digital converters, and to support that resolution, the rest of the signal chain has to be just as precise. Now, at first glance, the solution seems simple. Just search the vendor's website and filter for components that meet the desired criteria. The problem is that many of the factors that might compromise the integrity of your signal chain just aren't in the data sheet. If you don't have a reasonable insight as to what's behind the numbers, well, you might be in for a bumpy ride, and here's what I mean. In a typical system, what we want to do is to process a set of sensor inputs that may provide low amplitude signals that are just buried in noise. Now, this is kind of what you expect from signal sources like thermocouples and heart rate sensors and Hall effect sensors. After processing, the system is expected to produce analog outputs, and that might modulate the intensity of a light source or drive a servo mechanism. Now, in the middle of this arrangement is invariably a microcontroller that runs a signal processing algorithm. And to get the signals into and out of the digital realm, you have to have at least one ADC and at least one DAC. But the sensor signals, in most cases, aren't suitable for direct presentation to the ADC. They need some kind of amplification and probably some external filtering. And the output of the DAC is seldom ready to directly drive whatever needs the analog output. There's very often an output driver amplifier, and those amplifiers can contribute error components that we have to manage to get the most out of the signal chain. And that's not all. Don't forget that every data converter requires a reference, and those references just aren't perfect. They have a temperature coefficient, and they may themselves have an offset error. You have to take that into account as well. Here's the bottom line. What should be a perfectly linear y equals x relationship between the input of the signal chain to its output? Well, it may well contain artifacts that contribute to an offset and a slope error, so that y equals ax plus b, where a is some non-unity slope and b is some non-zero offset. Well, let's start with offset error. First, we'll take a look at the root causes of offset error and show you a couple of ways to deal with them. Then we'll take a look at rail-to-rail -rail amplifiers and some of the unique offset issues that they bring with them. Here's the input stage of a typical small signal amplifier. Now, you'll probably recognize it. It's a pretty standard differential amplifier. The transistor at the top is a current source. And if the inputs are equal, then the same current flows in both of the collector circuits of the paired transistors. So, the voltage at the load resistors is also equal. A small difference in the inputs causes a large shift in the currents, and thus you get a large difference in the output voltage. So far, so good. But the problem is that this analysis only holds if the transistors in the pair are identical and if the resistors that serve as the collector load are also identical. And as closely matched as transistors on the same IC die are, they are most certainly not identical. In a real transistor, the physical dimensions of the current carrying channel will be slightly different, and the lower impedance channel will carry more current than the higher impedance channel. Similarly, the resistors aren't perfect either. Worse, their resistance is going to vary with temperature, and most likely not in exactly the same way. And what's more, there are two more transistors in the circuit over to the right. They're common base amplifiers, and they help to isolate the input and the output to the gain stage, but like the components that made up the differential pair, they may not be perfectly matched. Now, in short, all of these differences add up to one thing. Even if you short the inputs together, you're very likely going to see a non-zero output. So, what to do? Well, you have several options. Here's one. The continuously auto-zeroing amplifier. 
Now, it's a pretty clever arrangement, and kind of simple once you understand how it works. The continuously auto-zeroing amplifier consists of two amplifiers, one that actually amplifies the input signal, and a second amplifier that serves as a nulling amplifier. The continuously auto-zeroing amplifier works in two phases. In phase one, the input to the nulling amplifier is shorted. In theory, the output should be zero, but in practice, we know that the input offset voltage will drive the output to some non-zero level. We store that output voltage on a capacitor and drive it back into the nulling amplifier as a correction factor. Now the nulling amplifier is corrected for its own input offset, and it's time to switch to phase two and find the correction factor for the main amplifier. To do that, we let the nulling amplifier see the same input as the main amplifier. Now, in any real-world application for a differential amplifier, we'll feed back part of the output to the inverting input. That keeps the inverting and non-inverting inputs very close together, but, and this is key, the input offset keeps them from being exactly equal. The nulling amplifier senses this difference and, with its own input offset nulled by the voltage on its capacitor, can send a correction factor to the main amplifier and store that correction factor on a second capacitor. And so it continues, switching to phase 1 to null the error in the nulling amplifier, and then switching to phase 2 to correct the error in the main amplifier. Now, the nice thing is that this works continuously over all variations in temperature and supply voltage that might trip up other systems. And notice that the signal path doesn't actually flow through the nulling amplifier. In fact, the nulling amplifier can have quite different characteristics than the main amplifier. But because the sampling noise will be present at the correction input of the main amplifier, one should keep signals of interest far away in frequency from the sampling rate. And perhaps that's a limitation. If you need precision without putting switching noise into the output spectrum, consider an amplifier that uses a power-up auto-zero technique. This kind of amplifier uses a successive approximation register to measure the input offset at power-up. You're probably already familiar with the successive approximation register. Now, it's used in some analog-to-digital converters because it quickly converges on an output code that represents the analog level of a given input. That's pretty clever. To start a conversion cycle, the SAR begins with just its most significant bit set. The value in the SAR is applied to a digital-to-analog converter, and if the DAC output is above the input voltage, the bit is cleared. Otherwise, the bit remains set, and then the next bit down is set, and the process repeats. If the DAC output is higher than the input voltage, the bit is cleared. Otherwise, it stays set. And when all the bits of the SAR have been tested this way, the SAR contains the closest digital approximation possible to the input voltage. Now, that's kind of what happens in a power-up auto-zero amplifier. On power-up, control circuitry shorts the inputs and a successive approximation register drives a DAC that feeds back to the correction input on the amplifier. When the SAR has tested every bit, the DAC contains a code that corrects the amplifier for input offset and the short can be removed. Now, the great thing about a power-up auto-zero amplifier is that you don't have to constantly sample and correct the input offset. It behaves just like an uncompensated amplifier in use because the compensation is done just that one time at power-up. The contents of the SAR are digital, so they don't degrade over time, and they remain valid until power is removed. The only real issue with the power-up auto-zero amplifier is that you can't continuously correct for changes in temperature and supply voltage. And, of course, you still have to deal with issues like 1 over F noise. Now, we're getting a little off topic here, but you really do need to be aware of 1 over F noise or pink noise. In many natural systems, there are sources of noise that appear more strongly at lower frequencies than at higher frequencies. In electronic systems, this is called 1 over F noise or flicker noise. It means that for a high quality amplifier, there will be a noise component that diminishes as frequency rises.
to be replaced at higher frequencies with a white noise component that's more or less independent of frequency. But at very low frequencies, the 1 over F noise component can be significant. One way of dealing with both input offset and 1 over F noise in one fell swoop is to use a chopper stabilized amplifier. Now, in a chopper stabilized amplifier, the input signal is modulated by a chopping frequency. Now, here's how this works. At the input, the inverting and non-inverting inputs to the first stage are alternately directly connected or they're swapped. The output of the first stage is then alternately presented directly or swapped before being passed to the second stage, which is configured as a low-pass filter. This action, alternately swapping or not swapping the inputs at each stage, causes the input offset to be either inverted or not inverted at the output, and properly filtered, it is effectively nulled. This activity has a secondary effect as well. A DC signal at the input is effectively converted to an AC signal at the chopping frequency. That means all of the signal artifacts associated with low frequencies, and in particular the 1 over F noise, are shifted up to the chopping frequency as well. So instead of seeing increased noise as the frequency gets closer to DC, you'll see only the intrinsic system white noise. The 1 over F noise is at the chopping frequency, and that's hopefully far away from your frequencies of interest. So, to summarize the effects of various input offset removal schemes on noise, power up auto zero amplifiers behave just like standard amplifiers. You're going to see increasing noise as frequency moves closer to DC. Continuously auto zeroing amplifiers will tend to have a flattened noise response near DC, but potentially more noise at frequencies of interest and chopper stabilized amplifiers are going to have only white noise components at most frequencies of interest with the 1 over F noise pushed up to the chopping frequencies. Now there's one more thing we need to cover as we talk about input offset and that's the rise of amplifiers that accept inputs all the way to the positive and negative power rails. Uh, you'll see these amplifiers called RRI amplifiers with RRI standing for rail-to-rail -rail inputs. Here's a little background. It used to be that you had to leave pretty significant headroom between the maximum expected excursion of input signals and the supply rails, and in particular, most MOS input amplifiers could accept input signals pretty close to the lower supply rail, often ground, but required significant headroom below the upper supply rail. Now, here's why. P-channel MOSFETs used in the input circuit are substantially linear, down to and slightly below the lower rail. But as the input gets closer to the upper rail, the gate gets closer to the source potential, and at some point, you're just out of headroom. The solution is to add another input section, this one built from in-channel MOSFETs. This input section can run in a linear way, all the way to the upper rail and slightly beyond, but it has to stay above the lower rail by a little more than a volt. Now, in this way, the P-channel FETs dominate in the lower half of the input range, while the in-channel FETs dominate in the upper half. Rail-to-rail -rail input operation. <laughs> Clever! Yeah, except for one thing. Now, instead of one input offset, you got to worry about two. Each input stage has its own input offset. As the common mode voltage moves from low to high, the offset voltage shifts from being dominated by the P-channel FETs to being dominated by the N-channel FETs. Now, that doesn't mean you should avoid amplifiers with rail-to-rail -rail inputs, but it does mean that you may have to figure out how to compensate for the unique input offset in some applications. Okay, now that we have a handle on the basics, let's take a look at a couple of real-world amplifiers. First up is the MAX 9614. It's a power-up auto-zero amplifier, which means that for noise purposes, it behaves like an ordinary, non-compensated amplifier. But every time it powers up, the inputs and the output disconnect as the device automatically zeroes itself. After a few milliseconds, it's ready to go. You can see that the input offset voltage is pretty good. 
typically just 17 microvolts at room temperature and no more than 165 microvolts after the auto calibration sequence over the entire temperature range. Next up is the Max 9620. This is a chopper stabilized amplifier and you can tell that right away by the input noise versus frequency chart. The maximum input noise is actually pretty high, almost 5,000 nanovolts per root hertz at the chopping frequency. But at the frequencies of interest below 10 kilohertz, the input noise is really low, about 30 nanovolts per root hertz. The input offset is really low too, just 800 nanovolts typical at room temperature, and no more than 25 microvolts over the entire temperature range. Okay, that's offset error. Now let's spend a few minutes talking about gain error. And to start with, I have to let you in on a dirty little secret. For most amplifiers and in most applications, gain error isn't intrinsically that big of a deal. Now to understand why, let's recall one of the basic concepts of electronic engineering, the ideal amplifier. An ideal voltage amplifier has three characteristics. It has infinite input impedance, which means it draws no current from the circuit that's driving its input. It has zero output impedance, meaning it can drive any load and still deliver exactly the proper voltage. And finally, it has infinite gain. If the amplifier has an infinite open loop gain, we can choose any closed loop gain we want just by adding negative feedback. Now, modern amplifiers come surprisingly close to this ideal, with many amplifiers giving you more than 130 decibels of open loop gain. Think about that. An amplifier with that kind of gain amplifies a signal by a factor of more than 3 million. Surely that's enough gain for any application. Well, let's think about that. Consider an amplifier with an open loop gain of 140 decibels. Now, if you're going to convert that to a ratio, you have to divide by 20, that gives you the value 7, and then you take 10 to that power, and that gives you 10 million. In normal use, you're going to use negative feedback to reduce the gain, let's say to 50. Now you're a factor of 200,000 away from the specified open loop gain. Put another way, any gain error in the system will be just 5 parts per million of a signal that drives the amplifier to its limits. Okay, so how does that stack up to other parts of the system? Well, a 1% resistor may be off by as much as 10,000 ppm. Even a resistor with a tolerance of one tenth of 1% could be off by as much as 1,000 ppm. Typical ADC inputs exhibit a full-scale error between 10 and 500 ppm. A voltage reference might be off by as much as 10,000 ppm, with good references being about 200 ppm. Okay, so putting on our engineering caps, 5 ppm doesn't sound too bad considering all the other sources of error, right? <laughs> well, not quite. Think of it this way. If you're driving a 20-bit ADC, that least significant bit is almost exactly one part per million you'd really like the input amplifier to be significantly better than that, but if you choose an amplifier with, let's say, a 140 decibel open loop gain and configure it to have a closed loop gain of 10, then that amplifier stage can be relied on only to the same level, about one part per million. That means the LSB output of the ADC is no longer reliable because it's going to vary with the gain error of the amplifier. And Hey, it may be worse than that. Take a look at this data sheet for one of Maxim's precision op amps. The typical open loop gain is 164 decibels. Man, that's great! And the device can drive the output to within 60 or so millivolts of the rails. Outstanding! But look at the open loop gain spec again. It's only good when V out is no closer than a half volt to the rails. What gives? And, and what happens to the gain if you do get within a half volt of the rail? Well, here's a typical output stage for an amplifier. It's two MOSFETs, a P-channel FET pulling high, and an N-channel FET pulling low. Now, remember, a MOSFET generally behaves like a voltage-controlled current source. 
As long as the drain to source voltage is high compared to the gate to source voltage, you can modulate the drain current by changing the gate voltage. That's the flat part of these curves. As you change the gate voltage, the drain current changes. A FET in this condition is said to be saturated because changing the drain voltage relative to the source has no effect on the drain current. For a MOSFET, this is the happy place and it's where you want it to operate. But as the gate voltage gets close to the drain voltage, that is, when the output gets close to one of the rails, the MOSFET stops being a constant current source. It starts to slip into the linear region where changes in drain voltage do affect drain current. The FET begins to behave more like a resistor than a current source and the change in the current with changes in the gate voltage is reduced. Thus, you get reduced gain and increased phase shift in the signal. And along with the increased phase shift, an increased likelihood of instability. And instability is the worst outcome. If the amplifier begins to oscillate or ring, the performance of the entire system is compromised. A solution, and it's a solution that companies across the industry use, is to intentionally reduce the gain significantly when the output begins to approach the rails. And by significantly, I mean a difference of about 40 decibels. And that gain reduction doesn't happen gradually. It's applied suddenly as soon as the output signal crosses a threshold near the rail. Here's what this looks like. This is a plot from a Max 44243 Precision Op Amp that's been configured as a simple voltage follower. Now, in this circuit configuration, the output of the op amp should follow the input voltage exactly. The y-axis in the plot is the difference between the input and the output in millivolts. Now, if the amplifier were perfect, the green line would exactly track the x-axis, and there would be zero difference between the input and the output for all input levels. And as we begin tracking in from the right, we can see that we're pretty close. The output is higher than the input, but only by about 20 microvolts. And more importantly, the difference is consistent. That means it would be really easy to remove that offset voltage if that's a problem. But when we get to about 165 millivolts, suddenly the offset jumps. What just happened? Well, the gain's been cut significantly. The gain had to be cut because the phase shift caused by the output MOSFET entering the linear region might cause circuit instability, and we can't have that. By reducing the gain, we increased the output offset voltage, and the compensation circuit is now operating to keep the effects of input offset in check, but it has less gain to work with. You can see that the compensation circuit is still working, but at a higher overall error for this voltage follower. Now, if you had an AC signal that was centered around this level, you'd see significant nonlinear distortion in the output. Of course, there is another option. You could reduce the overall speed of the op amp, and that would help keep the amplifier stable as the output MOSFETs begin to operate near their linear region, but Nobody likes a slow op amp, and there are lots of other ways to deal with the issue. You can avoid all these issues in your system design. If you have a negative supply available, then it's easy to bias the negative supply rail slightly below ground. That gives the amplifier the headroom to operate without getting into the reduced gain region. But not every system includes a negative supply, and if that describes your situation, you can choose an amplifier from Maxim with a built-in charge pump to provide the negative supply for you. Offset errors and gain errors. Even with compensation and good engineering practice, you'll still see slight errors, and you may need to compensate for them. The good news is that it's actually pretty easy. Hey, you have a microcontroller right there in the middle of your design, and if there is compensation to be done, well, it's most easily done in software. Most frequently, you can use a simple first-order correction factor. Since the desired system response is just y equals x, a first-order approximation on the actual system response is y equals ax plus b, and it's easy to compute a correction factor for any given y. 
The only question is, how do you come up with the best values for A, the slope, and B, the offset? Well, generally, there are four places in the operational life of your system where you can compute calibration and correction factors. First, you can load system calibration parameters at system build. Now, of course, these factors are going to be fixed and the offset and gain errors they're intended to calibrate out won't stay constant over time. So a potentially better solution is to include calibration facilities in the finished product and then recalibrate every time the system powers up. And this works great, as long as the system actually does power cycle from time to time. It's how some of Maxim's amplifiers calibrate their own input offset, and you can use similar techniques for your own system. But some systems don't power up from time to time. They rely on continuous uptime, and so you may need to use another method, timed recalibration. Time tree calibration takes the system offline from time to time to measure the system for the needed gain and offset error adjustments. Now, it's a good idea, especially for systems that are in harsh environmental conditions. Now, of course, you may not need to recalibrate at all. After all, component aging is a very long process and the useful life of the device may be shorter than the component aging window. Well, if that's the case, Maybe you only need to recalibrate the equipment when some event occurs that might actually affect the calibration, like changes in temperature. Maxim builds temperature sensors that can trigger an interrupt at the microcontroller when the temperature falls outside a given range, and you can use this interrupt as a mechanism to recompute the calibration parameters. Hey, whatever you choose, Maxim has you covered. Now you're up to speed on the causes and solutions to offset and gain errors in systems. Thank you for watching this video. For more information on this topic, please go to our website at www.maximintegrated.com under Product Analog. See you again in another educational video of Maxim Integrated.